Hello, welcome to our keynote today by Anna Kristalli on computational reproducibility. My name is Heidi Seibold, co-chair of this year's Virtual Use R. With me is Susanne Dundel, who will moderate the questions after the keynote today. As always, if you're watching this live, you can ask questions on Slido. The link is in the video description on YouTube. Before I introduce Anna, I would like to thank our sponsor, R Studio, for their support. Furthermore, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the entire organizing team in Germany and in the US for their amazing work. Another group that has helped us tremendously in setting up this conference was the R Foundation, and in particular, Heather Turner, Achim Seilers, and Thorsten Hutton. Thanks to all of you. Now let me introduce our amazing keynote speaker, Anna Kostali. Anna is an RSE at the University of Sheffield. I particularly like Anna's path as it shows that not only people who study computer science become, can become software engineers. Anna studied marine biology and in fact has a PhD in marine macroecology. Anna is an editor for Our Open Sci, a 2019 Software Sustainability Institute fellow and a co-organizer of the Sheffield R user group. Anna and I met uh, in one of the most beautiful places in the world, <laughs> <laughs> in Ticino, in Switzerland. Uh, we were both teaching at a summer school uh, on comp computational reproducibility. Swimming together in Lake Lugano, I learned from Anna about the term research software engineer and the work that RSEs do. Since then, I have been following Anna's amazing contributions to the scientific community, and I'm a huge fan of RepoHack. <laughs> If you don't know yet what a repo hack is, stay tuned because you will learn in this keynote. Before I hand over to Anna, I would like to remind you to ask questions about the keynote on Slido. If you're currently watching this on YouTube, you can find the li link to Slido in the video description. You can also upvote questions from others and make sure that they will be asked um, by our moderator, Susanne Dandel, who's here today as well. Now, without further ado, let me hand over to Anna. Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, I'll start by sharing my screen. So I think, is that working? Yes. Excellent. So thank you so much for the introduction, Heidi. I have to say, um, I was really looking forward to my first user experience in Munich this year. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm really excited to be here and really grateful for all the effort that the uh, organizers have put in um, to moving this event uh, remote. So hello everyone from Sheffield. Um, I think you got most of this from Heidi, but uh, I'll reiterate, uh, I'm uh, Anna Cristalli. Um, I'm a research software engineer here at the University of Sheffield. Uh, where our team helps our researchers do more with their code and data. I'm also an editor for R Urban Sci, and if you didn't catch Noam's talk uh, the other day, R Urban Sci curate a collection of R packages that help lower the barrier for researchers uh, who are working with uh, research code and data. And they do this through a community peer review system uh, and then finally, I'm also a co-organizer of our local uh, Sheffield R users group. So I'm gonna start my talk with a bit of personal background to help give some context to some of the topics I'm gonna be talking about and why I became interested in them. And it, as Heidi mentioned, my background is in marine biology. Um, although I didn't get a lot of time collecting uh, data on boats, uh, they were definitely some of the most exciting times in my studies. Uh, but in truth, uh, I was a complete data parasite during my PhD. So I uh, was basically working mainly in R, uh, trying to access and process and combine and analyze uh, other people's data. Um, I learned a lot about making maps uh, and most importantly, I just totally fell in love with R uh, and data science more generally. Um, but there were a couple of experiences before academia that I had that I found actually quite formative too. So the first one was um, my job as a, a quality assurance auditor for a contract research organization. So the research they do is regulated by uh, 
um, international legislation, which basically means if something goes wrong, they get sued. So they take quality assurance very seriously. Uh, and the sort of work we used to do was inspect work in the lab as it was going on. Uh, we would audit uh, raw data to the final reports, and then we would feedback um, any findings to management. Uh, so what I learned from this job is that inspecting people and people's work is hard, it's awkward, um, that sort of finger pointing and shaming doesn't really work that well, that it's far better to focus on system level solutions um, uh, and approaches. And, and it just the key is to make it easy to do the right thing and make it hard for people to do the wrong thing. So in my next job, I work as a uh, brand coordinator for an extreme sports equipment distributor. Um, and at that time I was quite good at Excel. So I ended up doing a lot of their cost of sales and priceless spreadsheets. Um, and it, if I made a mistake in one of those that could have sort of serious financial implications for the company. I also had to deal with dealers and that taught me the importance of data management the hard way because it's actually really embarrassing to have to ring up one of your dealers uh, who you promised this item for next day delivery, this item that was showing as one left in stock uh, and have to tell them that actually, you know, you can't find it, it's not in the warehouse. Um, so the key points in both these situations is that the uh, consequences for any errors came back directly to me. Uh, so that was a really strong incentive to check and double check for myself and think about how things could go wrong. So then I came back to uh, science and I, I really enjoyed the sort of spirit of discovery that comes with novel research. Um, but at the same time, I have to say, I, I did think, wow, like no one is checking anything really at all. I could say I'm doing anything. Um, so. I kind of wasn't really surprised when people started to look that they actually found the, the reproducibility crisis. Um, now there, there is a lot of elements that go into this. Um, a lot of them to do with our sort of broken publication system and an incentive system. Uh, but I think this, this particular quote captures our problem really well. Uh, so this quote states that an article about a computational result is advertising. It's not the actual scholarship, but the, the actual scholarship is the, the full software environment, code and data that produced uh, that result. Um, so our, our system is still geared primarily towards reviewing, publishing, distributing and archiving the advertisement. And, to me, that's a, that's a problem and, and that's actually a real shame as well because it's a bit of a waste. Um, there has been progress and the uh, computational reproducibility. So the ability to reproduce a result uh, from the same code and data has sort of been proposed as the minimum standard for uh, judging a scientific claim. And I think that's a, that is a really good start. And that sort of speaks to the, the first benefit of this transparency which is a, a verification. Um, but there is a super hidden power, uh, uh, sorry, a hidden superpower and my, my favorite gif is missing from behind there. Uh, but I, I only started to really understand that superpower uh, when I started learning more about open source and version control and Git, and in particular through the Mozilla Open Leadership Training Program um, of which I was a member of the first cohort. Uh, and it, it really crystallized for me the first uh, time I made a fork of an online repository. And I, I remember think, really clearly thinking, whoa, it's evolution. Oh, my gifts aren't turning out, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, this is evolution. And, uh, and I, I thought at the time that um, uh, data, so, sort of code would make a really interesting data set to look for. Um, evolutionary patterns. And so I was really excited when I, I saw this paper um, in which a bunch of microecologists had a look for macroecological and macroevolutionary patterns in the, the Linux code base. And indeed they found uh, 
patterns that we find in biological systems uh, in uh, the code base, which I have found really, really interesting. Um, I think a more tangible example that I really enjoy is, is that of the Gapminder project. Um, so Hans Rosling's talk on the project uh, is one of my favorite TED Talks. And I only realized a couple of years ago that he was actually back in 2006 talking about open data science and uh, talking about how the project was trying to liberate data from the UN databases and governmental databases, other databases, try and bring them together, make them accessible to the public via the web uh, and provide tools uh, for people to be able to, to visualize and analyze and, and sort of animate that data and get meaning out of them. Um, and I really think it speaks to, to their efforts, just how far Gapminder has come today, in which now there, there's a subset of the database, uh, data set available through the Gapminder project, and then with a couple more lines of code from a couple more packages, we get this anyone can produce this uh, really nice sort of interactive uh, visualization, which I think is really cool. So that speaks to benefit number two. So this uh, openness and transparency uh, is a means of supercharging our, our research cycle. Okay, so we, we've established that we have good reason to attempt uh, to move towards reproducibility, but how well are we actually doing? Um, I'd say reproducibility attracts a lot more attention now from funders as well. Uh, training has definitely uh, improved. Um, I'm a bit biased, but I see the, the rise of the research software engineer is a positive thing in trying to retain the skills that we need in academia. And I do see uh, more people uh, publishing code and data maybe less or so is sort of a gold standard of a, a linked and executable code and data. Um, but in terms of, is our research more reproducible? That's actually a really hard question to answer because we don't actually, we still don't actually have a systematic way um, to widely check our papers uh, for, for reproducibility. And so it kind of reminds me of that uh, saying about, you know, if, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's there to hear it, uh, does it actually make a sound? And it just makes me think if a paper claims to be reproducible, but no one's around to check it, is it really reproducible? Then I, I see another uh, challenge we're facing is that we don't really have a formal space and method to practice uh, reproducibility. And um, anyone who's ever tried to learn an instrument or a sport or anything really uh, knows that this is an unbreakable uh, law of the universe that, you know, to get good at something we need to practice. So if we want to produce reproducible uh, papers, we need to practice producing them. Uh, and if we want to get good at using other people's materials, we sort of need to practice being able to do that as well. And so these were really the two motivating um, sort of factors behind uh, the Reberhack project, uh, which we set up, which is basically, we wanted to answer the question, how reproducible are our papers? And how can we uh, practice reproducibility uh, effectively. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about some Weber hack history. Uh, the events uh, first started off as part of uh, OpenCon satellite events in Berlin and London. And they were initially inspired by Owen Petchy's Reproducible Research and Ecology and Evolutionary Behavior course. Uh, in which students take um, a few months and a number of sessions to reproduce published results from the raw data. Now we only had a day to do this. So we set the Reberhack mission to be, to reproduce paper, a, a paper in a day from code and data. Now, not much happens after those events until in 2019, 
I joined the Software Sustainability Institute Fellowship cohort. Um, and my proposal uh, for the, my fellowship was to uh, resurrect, um, re resurrect sort of the project, try and further develop it. Um, and then, um, yeah, try and further develop it and run a series of events. So the first one uh, was a Carpentry Connect Manchester, and that went quite well, uh, but more importantly, sort of got the word out. And soon after uh, I got in, uh, uh, yeah, soon after I got in, um, uh, I got contacted by um, a bunch of our ladies from the Netherlands and they really, they wanted to uh, set up their own event in Leiden. And they actually managed to put on the best Reaver hack I'd say so far. Uh, they managed to get uh, about 40 participants to come down and uh, on a Saturday, uh, they managed to double the paper, the paper list that we had. Uh, and more importantly, they just really managed to get a really good atmosphere at the event. But the coolest thing really that came out of that was that we ended up with a core team. Uh, a lot of those ladies decided to join the project and help out. So I'd really like to give each one of them a shout out. Uh, so we have Paloma Rojas Saunero, Saunero Daniela Gavins, Linda Nab, Ricardo Probert, myself, and Florencia de Andrea. And so we are the Reaver Hack team and I'd like to thank these ladies because the project couldn't really be what it is today without them. And then another uh, nice bit of news that we got is that um, the, the N8, which is a partnership between the northern, mo the eight northern most research intensive institutions in the UK, um, and through their, the CIR, they provide uh, funding um, to help promote better practice in computational intensive research. And they liked the concept of the event, so they decided they were going to support five events between January and March uh, of this year. And uh, as people might know, March was a bit of a tricky month, so we ended up having to cancel our Manchester event. Um, uh, but that wasn't so bad because in the end it forced us to um, uh, work with an idea we talked about right from the start and that was to run a remote Reaper hack. So this was actually, uh, I thought, really successful. Uh, a lot of pluses. So the first uh, is that much of our, the Reaper hack core team was able to make it to the event. Um, and we even had uh, participants joining from even further away, including Japan, Argentina, Netherlands, Sweden, and the US. Uh, but we also managed to introduce some talks throughout the day, some really pointed talks, which uh, um, added some uh, uh, more in informative sort of sessions to the day. Okay, so enough about the history. How does this thing actually work? So um, um, on the day, sorry, I'm kind of irritated that my uh, tweets are not coming out right. But anyways, on the day, uh, Maybe we have- Maybe you can try refreshing um, because yeah. for me, it works. For you, it works. Yeah. Well, if you're seeing them right, then it's great. I just have, I don't know what's going on. So, um, but I mean, I see them when I open your slides. Maybe you can just refresh and then it's okay. Your yeah. browser. No, it was, I don't okay. know why it's doing this. It was working. Okay. Anyways, apologies. The, uh, oh, here we go. Oh, thanks, Heidi. <laughs> sure. Oh, I wasn't expecting to have to do this in my first keynote. Okay. So, uh, yes. At the um, leading up to the event in the current format, we have a call for papers uh, where we ask uh, authors to submit their paper code and data for reproduction. And if everything goes well, hopefully you end up with this uh, with this nice um, uh, paper list that participants can work from on the day. So on the day, we start with a little bit of an introduction. 
And then uh, participants are free to review the paper list, uh, select papers they want to work on, and if they want, form groups. The rest of the day is spent working with the materials and trying to reproduce them. Um, at various points in the day, we regroup uh, to discuss how we're all doing. Um, and then the most important part of the day is the um, feedback to, uh, to the author. So throughout the day, we ask the uh, participants to collect uh, to sort of record their experiences with the materials. And we also ask them to score the paper uh, on a scale of one to 10 on reproducibility, reusability, transparency, uh, and documentation, okay? And the important, most important thing by the end of the day that we ask them to do is to submit that form so we can pass that on to the authors. So as I said, we, we start with a bit of an introduction and there we give a few tips for reproducing and reviewing. Uh, in terms of selecting papers, um, participants have information submitted by authors available to them. So they will know what sort of languages or tools are used. Um, and also authors provide a bit of uh, information on why people should attempt their paper. And then after feedback from participants, we also added these two metrics. So the first one was a uh, number of attempts or number of times someone has already reproduced this paper. And then if it had been reproduced, what's the mean score uh, for that paper? So people could decide if they wanted to be, you know, to try something hard, they could go for a low score, something easier or, or a good example, a, a higher score. And if they wanted to be adventurous, they could just try a paper that hadn't been attempted at all yet. Now, in terms of uh, when they're reviewing, uh, we ask them first and foremost to sort of review as an auditor. So we're looking for uh, fair principles, which I think are beautifully illustrated by this uh, Turing Way illustration. illustration. So wherever you see the Scriberia uh, uh, watermark, it's, it's one of the Turing Way um, illustrations. So we're looking for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable materials. And more specifically, we ask them to, to think about um, uh, the aspect of access and installation, and in particular how easy that was, or how automated it was, and whether they um, had any problems. Uh, we ask them to think about the data, whether it was clearly separated, uh, were large uh, sort of data files deposited, uh, were, were they archived correctly, and were they documented in any way? We also ask them to think about documentation uh, more generally, especially with respect to installation and using and citing the materials. And in terms of the analysis, we ask them to, uh, uh, you know, we're looking for, for how they got on with reproducing the paper and how easy that was, but also how easy it was to uh, link the, the code to the outputs and the uh, results that are being uh, used in the paper. Now, if they didn't manage to reproduce the analysis, again, we're trying to get them to think about why. So were there missing dependencies that you only found out about now, or what was computational environment not adequately specified, or, or did you start finding bugs in the code? The other perspective we ask them to take is that of a user. So, and there's two particular user profiles that I feel are really uh, useful. The first one is of a new user. And in this case, unfamiliarity with the, uh, the tools and approaches that are being used is actually a superpower and can help point to uh, sort of gaps in the documentation or confusing workflows or, or something like that. And then the other uh, useful profile is that of an invested user. So the, these, you know, an investor user uh, wants to use this thing. It wants, they want them to work. Uh, uh, and so they, and they can really help with uh, usability and, and seeing whether um, something is fit for purpose. Finally, something we stress uh, throughout the day and in our code of conduct is to feedback as a community member. So we ask people to acknowledge author effort, to give their feedback in good faith and to focus on community benefits. And we stress that the 
that Reber hacks are basically an opportunity to help build convention on what form we want a reproducible uh, paper to take and what we want to be able uh, to use it for. Okay, so what did we learn throughout the NA uh, Reaper Hack series? So a few stats to start off with. So we've had 38 papers submitted so far. We reached about a total of 70 participants and they completed 39 reviews over 27 papers. So in terms of the scores they gave the papers, uh, we can see there are sort of, most of them are skew towards decent scores with uh, medians of about seven apart from transparency, which is a little bit uh, lower. Um, but we do see a wide range and all, all, all the way down to ones and twos. And I think it's uh, important to note that these, these papers were self-selected uh, because they thought they were reproducible. So, so really, you know, I think we still would be wanting to see everything more in the seven and above. So, so, okay, we're doing well, but yeah, we've still got some work to do. Now, um, with respect to the textual responses, I'm just gonna focus on two questions that we ask participants. Um, and that is uh, that um, what they found uh, positive about the approaches the papers took and what they found challenging about the aspects they took. And what we're seeing here is the difference in relative frequency of the top 40 terms uh, they use when, when talking about this. And uh, the first thing that really jumps out at me is um, this, the tense of the verb run between the two questions. So in the challenges, uh, the code is still running. Um, so it's still doing something. Whereas in the positives, okay, it's a lot smaller, uh, but the tense is it ran. So it's something completed. Um, other things associated with challenges that we see are versions, uh, install, packages, error, uh, required. And I think all these relate to not specifying the computational environment completely. And I think this is why Docker, which is not the easiest thing in the world, is actually coming out more as a, as a, as a positive aspect in terms of a reproducibility approach. Now, in terms of things people found positive, I don't think it's a big surprise that the biggest word is easy. So um, it should be easy to reproduce papers and others really appreciate that. And just one other thing I'd like to pick out is that literate programming is definitely coming out as, as something that um, people, um, participants enjoyed working with. Okay, um, I know this isn't a super robust statistical analysis, but I did want to show this plot because I think it links into some anecdotal evidence we've seen. And that's that um, as we approach sort of higher reproducibility with our current tools, there might be a trade off between um, other aspects like transparency and reuse. And I think what this relates to is one, using Docker, which is, is great because, yes, you can reproduce the paper, and I'll talk about this more in a sec, uh, but it's harder to, to merge uh, stuff into your own workflow when they're packaged in Docker. And then the other thing is that uh, in, in terms of transparency, like if we make it super automated, so there's one command and it just runs and you get your PDF out at the end of it, often that leaves people not really understanding what happened underneath and where the code that does different bits and pieces is. So, um, so I think as we move forward, it would be useful to think about these things uh, and how different approaches can uh, uh, allow different aspects. And finally, I think this, the biggest finding really was, uh, well, one of the biggest findings is that the Reaper hacks are actually fun and uh, we got really good feedback from our participants. They really enjoyed the low pressure environment and being able to take that time to play around with these, uh, with these tools and other people's um, work. We also find them a, a great opportunity for peer skill sharing. So in almost all the events, we had some sort of breakout uh, tutorial session by peers. And I think that worked really well. 
But I think what excites me the most is that I, I really think they are fit for purpose. And I think this tweet uh, really captures it. And that I, I really think if someone tries to reproduce someone else's work, it can really have important lessons for how they go forward to try and make their own work reproducible. One second. <laughs> okay. So how do we take um, all these lessons and, and, and try and move forward? Um, well, one thing I'll say about uh, Reaper Hacks and Reviewing at the minute is that it does feel a little bit lopsided. I think what we, we really need to focus on defining what exactly it is that this reproducible paper that we're exp we expect researchers to start producing now is. What exactly is it? How should it be built, um, et cetera? And I think only then can we start uh, teaching researchers how to create these and helping them build tools to, to make it easier to create. And then only can we sort of review them against the standard. And I think this is actually quite topical now, um, at least in the UK, because the uh, SAGE group that was set up uh, by the government uh, in response to COVID has actually requested code reviews, has started requesting code reviews on important COVID related papers that are informing policy. And our, our team has actually been part of uh, one of these reviews. Um, and it, in principle, I agree that it's a good idea, but it does feel unfair to me that to be reviewing people when no one has told them from the beginning or taught them from the beginning how to do all this stuff. And, and we tried to make that really clear in our review. So um, all of these can be improved with practice, uh, but I really think we should concentrate for starters in the defining what it is exactly that we wanna be producing. And when you're trying to define a concept, I think the best place is to start uh, with a good name. And I think Resource Compendium is a really good name for what it is we're trying to produce. And the, the concept of a Resource Compendium was described uh, by gentlemen in Temple Land in 2004 in their paper. Uh, and where they described a compendium as both a container for all the different elements that uh, make up the document and its computation. So all the text, code and data but also as a means for distributing, managing and, and updating the collection. And the principles governing a research compendium are, firstly, stick with peer conventions, keep data methods and outputs separate and try and specify the computational environment as clearly as possible. And now this sticking with peer conventions is actually quite powerful. Um, and I think we're really lucky in R because a lot of good work has been done on uh, how can we use uh, the uh, conventions in R um, to, uh, to build a, a framework for um, research compendia. And in this particular pa paper, Marwick et al. Um, actually make the case that an R package structure is actually an excellent way for uh, sharing research compendia. And by following this, the convention of our package structure, um, not only uh, do we make all the tools that already exist for testing, documenting, uh, publishing, sharing code uh, available to us, but then we can also build on top of it with the uh, automation templates and checklists that might be more appropriate for a research compendium. Um, so this now brings us to creating the next step. And for this, again, I feel we're really lucky in R because we've got this package called RR Tools. And the goal of RR Tools is to provide instructions, templates, and functions uh, for making a basic com compendium suitable for writing reproducible research in R. So it's still on GitHub, this package, so you will have to install it from there. But once you do, you have these functions available to you. So the first one uh, helps you create a compendium. And what I like about the functions in this package is they're at every step they're telling you exactly what they're doing. So it's, it's telling you here at, at, at the start that it's basically building an R package skeleton uh, which, uh, with these four files. 
and directories. Uh, it's making it an R project, which is nice for um, our user, for our studio users. And then it launches it as well. And the other thing I really like about their functions is that there's little, these little checklists at the bottom uh, prompting you towards next steps or, or further information. So here it mentions uh, editing the description file is a first step. So the description file is basically uh, the backbone of our package. And it's it, the first role it has is to collect metadata about um, our package, or in this case, our compendium. So this would be uh, titles, versions, uh, details of all the authors, and maybe a description as well. So once we've completed that information, we can prepare our uh, research compendium for sharing. And we use, use this use readme rmd function. And again, it's telling us what it's doing. So the first thing it does is it creates a uh, template readme that is much more appropriate for a research compendium. So um, the nice thing about this is it, it guides uh, researchers towards completing the, all the information that would be required for a research compendium. It also um, um, creates a, a code of conduct, a template code of conduct that you can add to, and then also a contributing uh, document where uh, uh, you can put in any information about how you want con uh, contributors and collaborators to work with your project. Finally, you want to write your paper. So to create a, an analysis folder with a very reasonable um, file structure, we use this use analysis function and this creates this directory and inside it uh, also creates a, a template uh, paper R markdown that again walks you through the features um, of, of this particular template. So again, it's telling you um, where, uh, what file to start um, editing um, in the beginning. And then it also prompts you to other information like how to um, change the citation style, how to add bibliographic details um, and other uh, cool features that are available through this package. Now, once you've written your paper, you'll also want to capture any R package dependencies you might have. And again, there's a really handy function called add dependencies to description, pretty descriptive. And what that does is, is it scans all your, any R markdown and R um, files in, the, uh, in your project and it adds them to the description file. So the other function of the description file is to um, list all the dependencies of your package. Now, one thing I'll say here is you can see that we, we in R, because of how our libraries are, ma are managed, we can't specify di exact versions of libraries. So that's why at least it specifies minimum versions of libraries. If you really want a robust workflow where you're specifying exactly what package is to be used with your paper, you might want to check out package RN, which used to be Packrat, and I've put a link there to a nice example of a paper that uses that. Um, there's a couple other uh, helpers that are really useful for writing papers in R. One of them is package articles, and this uh, provides a collection of R markdown templates for uh, uh, in the format of many popular journals. And then the other one is the CITER package. So this provides an add-in that is able to read the bibliographic information from a bib file, and then allows the user to interactively insert citations into uh, the, in, in Markdown in their document. Okay, so we've actually covered a lot already, um, but is this enough? Uh, I think a lot of researchers might stop there. And the sad answer is that sometimes and often that might not be enough. And I'll just use the case of uh, trying to share a geospatial analysis in R as an example. So um, um, geospatial analysis in R requires system library GDAL. Now this isn't an R package, it's a, I think C or C++ library. So an external library that is required. And if uh, you share your analysis with a friend 
and they don't have GDAL installed on their um, system, you will get an error and well, they will get an error and they will just have this uh, uh, unhappy experience uh, shown here. Okay, which leads me to having to talk about Docker. Let's see how good a job I can do. So if you go to the Docker website, so what is Docker? Um, uh, so if you go to the Docker website, you'll get this description. They're uh, described as standardized units of software that package everything needed to run an application, which includes code, runtime, system tools. I think that includes, it includes a system, uh, operating system, any system libraries like the GDAR library I just discussed and any other settings in a lightweight and standalone executable package. Well, that sounds really great. What does it actually uh, entail? So basically what it boils down to is you start with a Docker file. So this is just a text file, okay? And that contains a recipe basically for setting up this computational environment. So you might be specifying an operating system, what sort of uh, system libraries you want to install, uh, what files you want to uh, copy into it. Uh, and, and then you can also get it to do other stuff um, run other uh, commands too. Now, once you've got your Docker file, if you want to make it executable or, or so create this sort of mini computer, um, you have to build it. Uh, you have to build a Docker image from the Docker file. And basically what, what that is, is Docker executes all the instructions you've provided in the text file and it creates uh, this sort of mini computer ready to go. Uh, uh, according to your instructions. And now this Docker image, so, so in a Docker image, all your R packages and all those other libraries are actually installed, okay? And then to use the image, uh, so it, they become containers when you actually run them, okay? And you run a Docker image. So you go from a Docker file to a Docker image and then to a Docker contain. Now, I'm gonna be the first uh, to say that I am not an expert in Docker at all, and I just know what I need uh, to get by. Uh, but what I will say is that um, uh, there's a couple of things that help me understand Docker a bit better. And one of them is that you can use uh, other people's base images as the start of your own. And what that means is that other people that know what they're doing can create Docker images that other people can use and build on top of. And this is what the Rocker project is. Um, and they, they uh, curate a collection of Docker images for working with R. And in particular, they've got this geospatial one, uh, which has all the libraries we need to work uh, uh, with a geospatial analysis. And then we get these people with this happy experience. So, the other thing that really helped me uh, learn about Docker is that there's a uh, handy RR tools um, function called use Docker file. And this creates a sensible template um, for uh, archiving a research compendium with Docker. And just having a look at what this Docker file um, contains. So here, this is, is pulling a uh, base from Rocker. This time it's the verse one, but if you wanted to use the geospatial, this is where you would change it. I've added some of my own uh, details, but in effect what it's doing is, um, he is copying all my uh, compendium into the container and then installs any other system requirements, installs the package, the compendium package, which means all my dependencies are installed, and then also renders the paper as the last step. Now, if you wanted to build this image, you it, uh, locally you would have to use Docker, but you can get uh, a continuous integration system to do that for you instead. Uh, and so again, um, our tools comes to the rescue and provides this function, which allows you to create a Travis template um, that will uh, do the building for you. And the cool thing that uh, this does, so this is an example of the Travis YAML it um, creates, but I think the important thing that it does is that it 
before uh, installing or running any tests, it will um, it builds a Docker image, and to build successfully, the Docker image needs the um, R Markdown document. So your paper needs to render. So if that succeeds, then Travis will push uh, a Docker uh, your Docker image, your successful Docker image, to Docker Hub, where it is archived, and other people can use it. So if you set this all up correctly and your paper renders successfully, then you will get a nice archive ver uh, image on Docker Hub um, where you know your paper works. So I've not got much time left. So I just wanted to uh, end my talk with uh, just a few general thoughts um, about moving forward. And one of them is uh, on reproducible lab culture. So documentation is the, the heart of communities of practice. And for me, projects like the Turing Way, uh, which are a, a community source uh, guide to reproducible data science, are a great way, uh, a great resource for general best practice. But I think it, for this to be uh, valuable uh, on the ground, this really needs to be translated to sort of specific lab or research group um, general practices. I think we can use templates, checklists, and automations to help us uh, do stuff like that. Uh, I think what people need to um, focus on is on uh, providing clear and complete onboarding uh, instructions, guidance on how to create and manage digital resources, and clear offboarding procedures as well. But I think some of this, some of these, the basics can be templated and provided in customizable formats for labs themselves uh, to, to, to sort of build on. And as an example, um, this was a, a project we worked on at collaboration workshops um, and the collaboration workshop hackathon, where we tried to build a library of GitHub uh, issue templates that other people could use and, and uh, build on top of. On the future of reviewing, so I've, I've sort of gone through and dreamed up a few scenarios of how uh, our reviews could look if people were publishing research compendia. And um, we, f we find in this first uh, example, someone found some bugs or typos, it, small bugs, and just corrected them. In others, this uh, led to a more um, uh, meaningful sort of uh, collaboration. Uh, and and it, the last one is for review too. It's it's a bit of a of a joke, um, but I don't mean I'm not suggesting that such engagement is necessarily uh, should be necessary for me reviewers. Uh, but if you do make it easy for people to contribute, often they do, and I do see these kind of meaningful contributions all the time in uh, our and Sci uh, reviews. On the scope of reproducibility, I feel that uh, reproducibility ad infinitum uh, is unrealistic. And I think thinking about uh, maintaining reproducibility for maybe two or three years post publication might be a bit more realistic. But the important thing being that it's checked as part of the publication process. And uh, for this, I think code check, the project code check uh, is um, a, a, lot, uh, um, a lot more in that way. Uh, on the scope of reusability, I think the openness can help surface useful parts of codes and facilitate user feedback and contribution. So we can sort of pick out what we might need, want to, uh, what is useful. Uh, but I think then we need to start having a really important conversation about uh, a maintenance of stuff that we find that it's useful to pick out uh, uh, and reuse. In the meantime, uh, I think we should take any opportunity to practice. Uh, and there are many ways to reaper hack. Um, and we've already tried sort of event and remote reaper hacks, but what I'd really be interested in seeing more people try to do is this uh, research group uh, reaper hack. And this could be maybe is a research group you meet before people publish their papers and you try and reproduce each other's papers. Uh, but ultimately, it's more about normalizing uh, both reproducible research and working with other people's uh, materials. 
Now to facilitate this, we're trying to, we're building a, a hub that can centralize uh, all of our activities. So uh, look out for that. Um, and yeah, again, I, I have to thank the NACIR because they've provided some funding for us to actually uh, finish this, um, this hub. So hopefully soon you'll be able to propose a paper, submit reviews and organize events through this hub. Now, if you're interested in reverb hacking, um, you can check out our GitHub repository. You can chat to us on Slack, but I'd love you to consider hosting your own events or uh, once the hub is up, submitting your own uh, papers for review as well. So to summarize, um, I think we do still face challenges to moving from the theory of reproducibility to the practice of it. Um, I think we really need to clearly define our expectations of what a research compendium should be, and that is likely to be domain specific. But this will really allow us to develop the tools and templates to help with their creation. And finally, Reaver Hacks provide great opportunity to practice. So thanks everyone for watching and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. So before we start the Q&A session, first, I would like to thank you, Anna, for sharing your knowledge um, about reproducibility in open science with us. And as a PhD student in data science, I will definitely adopt your suggestion in my current and future projects and um, will try out the RR tools package and dockers. And uh, so thank you very much for the inspiration. Well, I'm not only a PhD student, I'm also a member of the USR organization team. And now I have the honor to moderate the questions we received via Slido. So feel free to continue submitting questions via Slido and upvote the questions um, of others. Um, you see the uh, link in the description below the YouTube video. Now let's start with the first question with the most uh, votes or thumbs up. So Anna, in your <laughs> 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 no, not the first one. Um, in your experience, in terms of reproducibility, um, what is the most common high stake mistake in a research project? Honestly, the mo the simplest thing I find is a lack of documentation. Just not some of the problems people are having trying to reproduce other people's papers is they just couldn't figure out how to put it together. So a few lines of documentation, like a decent README would have solved a, a lot of those problems. So yeah, the, the first thing I'd say is, is documentation. The other problems people were having were exactly um, the ones I mentioned. So uh, about not specifying the computational environment um, more completely. Um, and that, that's why I was talking about Docker and I wish I had more time. Uh, um, I wanted to speak about Binder as well, uh, which is a, um, well, basically, you can turn your repository into um, um, a live project and you can start working with the code in it. Um, that might be an easier way in to providing a sort of reproducible version of your project than uh, um, Docker. But if you have set your project up with Docker, you can just use that to, to binderize it as well. Cool. Um... We received a lot of questions, so um, I get already to the next question, which I also find really interesting. Um, do you have any tips to encourage more researchers to do reproducibility, reproducible science? Oh. Um, honestly, I don't know. We've been trying to talk about how we're gonna, uh, um, you know, I could talk about the incentive systems and how they're still broken and, and, and um, you know, reproducible research isn't valued or the time that it takes. What I would say is it actually makes my work faster, not at the beginning, um, but once, because a lot of what I talked about, especially works on convention and having a convention and learning a convention really makes you work a lot faster uh, in your subsequent projects. Um, so from a selfish perspective, I would say 
just do it for yourself because you will thank yourself, you know, even six months down the line or, or two years down the line. Um, so reproducibility definitely helps you as a researcher be able to pick up uh, a bit of work and, and build on it further down the line. So I'd say for me, that would be a, a motivating force. But personally, I, I just, now that I've learned a lot of these tools, I, I find working a lot easier. And maybe uh, people can also be forced by um, being uh, or letting it be a requirement for the acceptance of a paper at a journal sure, or sure. conference. <laughs> sure. But like I said, if we do that, then we, if we're going to require that, we really have to define, you know, when you try and submit a paper, you have very long and detailed instructions of, you know, how many lines or whatever. And then we don't have anything like that for, you know, what, what should the code and data, what state would, would that uh, be in? So we kind of really need to, to tackle that uh, before I think we can have any expectations of, of researchers, really, I think, if we're going to be fair. True, yeah. So the next question is, um, do you think there would be a way to do a mini repo hack or some modified version of a repo hack in a class with students? Actually, I've been approached to try and do it with undergrad, uh, in undergraduates. I'm going to assume undergraduates. Yes, why not? Uh, it, it kind of, I mean, I don't know if I do this with uh, undergraduates that haven't programmed at all. Uh, but I do know that at our university here at Sheffield and my old department where I studied, they're all teaching in R now, the, the whole degree is, is in R. Um, so this is ecology. Um, but so yeah, I would start taking that into, um, uh, into um, undergraduate classes and why not? It's more interesting than just reading papers all the time. It is fun, it is interesting working with other people's materials, it really is. Yeah, and it's also something Heidi did last year, so maybe yes. we can discuss this later. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but now to the next question. Um, if I send a paper with code to a journal, it is possible to get RipperHack code review and therefore any kind of RipperHack approved certification. Okay, so uh, I'm annoyed because I felt like I was running out of time, so I didn't explain code check very well. So I, I actually, um, I think code check is what um what they do is they do check for the paper for reproducibility but then they they provide you with the pdf report of it and then also a badge that goes on the paper and i know they are working with journals to incorporate that so i think that's what's going to end up more or something similar part of the publication system i sort of see reaper hack at the minute is more of an educational um activity it de definitely does help authors um and i think especially now that as i explained we don't really have the standards to be reviewing officially um and so we need these sort of low pressure environments for both the authors and the um participants to work in um that that's kind of where i see reaper hack sitting so if you're you're thinking about your your papers and getting sort of reproducibility reports i would go to code check check out code check. So the next question is of Heidi. So I'm not sure if she wants to ask the question herself. Okay, I guess I can. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, so the, as you, Susanna mentioned, I taught a class last year where we did um, sort of like a repro hack in a class. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was the hardest thing to actually define what reproducibility means. So how do you score papers with oh, no. reproducibility? Okay, we've had a lot of discussion about this. Uh, and, and that's why, again, the, the scores I showed or the plots, you know, we have to take them with a pinch of salt. There's a lot of subjectivity. I mean, honestly, to, to what we sort of got down to is, okay, a full easy reproducibility is a 10 and then just start taking points off for you know things that went wrong I mean, yeah I, I don't know <laughs> uh, that's kind of how we did it but honestly there's a lot of subjectivity in the in the our scoring <laughs> I would say but yeah that that that's a that's a hard question to answer thank you I, I think the more we work with materials the more we do this and normalize this though 
you know, we'll start getting answers to that too. Thanks. Good. Um, so due to the time, um, I will ask you two last questions. Mm -hmm. I think one you already answered. Um, it's about, um, is there a centralized resource to help me organize a Ripper hack life like there event will my community? There will be. So this website that we're working, uh, that we're working on, uh, that hopefully by August, uh, it will be up and running or at least a testing version of it. Um, yes, that's people. Um, so organizers will be able to submit details of events. Uh, you'll be able to submit papers if you want it, them to be reviewed. But obviously these get reviewed uh, at events. So who knows, what, what, you don't know when you might get the review. Uh, and then also the, uh, we'll be collecting feedback by participants through that same platform. So hopefully at some point we might be able to make that data available as well. Uh, for, for people to learn and analyze. Very nice. Um, so now to the last question, which, which is actually a long one. Okay. <laughs> it's from Maria. Um, how do you keep a paper reproducible when you have a large simulation run on uh, an external server that stands alone outside of the data analysis part? Do yeah. you focus on keeping the analysis and paper reproducible and assume simulation was okay? Yeah. Uh, that's a hard one. I mean, um, we, in fact, we have talked about uh, trying to run a, a HPC, so a, a high performance computing Reaper hack, where maybe we can uh, try and put some of these papers to the test. Um, I think you, you could check the results out, you know, that the rest of the paper is reproducible. So once you get all your simulation results, if there are you know, any other plots that you do, and you, we can check that. Uh, but yeah, it'll, that, needs, that needs work um, uh, in terms of being able to reproduce our really computationally expensive work. We're not there yet. Now, <laughs> 60 minutes are over. So thank you again, Anna, for your time and uh, inspirational talk. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, we'll pass on the remaining questions to Anna. Maybe uh, she wants to answer one or the other on Twitter. Um, you've seen her uh, Twitter handle throughout the talk, so you can follow her there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Stopping the stream now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.